4 p.m. GMT uh, panel session on warehouse loading bay safety with some loading bay automation in there as well. I'm joined by some fantastic uh, expertise from around the world. We've got Wouter Satijn from uh, Jaloda Haida role in the Netherlands. Wouter's the MD there, who will talk about loading bay automation. We have James Ryan, who is the uh, owner of Century Pro, coming to us from Cleveland, Ohio. Mark Kennedy from GMR, and Mark's in Florida today to talk about their PowerShop product. And Peter Poulin of Right Height, uh, who, of course, well known for uh, loading bay and warehouse safety products. So I think, shall we start with you, Peter? Um, okay. and maybe tell us a bit about what you do and let's start us off. Yeah, um, well, obviously, um, I think James and Mark will know uh, Right Height from the US. Uh, that's where they started in the mid 60s um, with uh, the, the, the White family. It's still family owned business um, and still running uh, and obviously spread to around the world. And we've got a number of um, sites in uh, Europe. I mean, Netherlands, we've got quite a, a big base there with uh, our colleague Wim uh, Zwicker. You may not know about her, but he, he runs the Netherlands and and the, and the UK now. Um, but basically, it it, it came out um, doing dock levelers. That's really what they started off doing, um, uh, and they're still one of the biggest dock leveler manufacturers in the US. And then moved really into safety in the mid 70s when um, Mike White went to a, a just a. a haulage association meeting where someone right at the end under any other business said that someone had uh, got killed on the loading dock and it was just a sort of ad hoc comment and that's what led him to ask the question of the guy what happened and he then thought about securing the lorry at the dock and, and to be fair yeah after five years of research and development he came up with the wheel restraint the dock lock in the US which started from 1980 so really that's where the business started growing and then doing dock shelters. So it does everything associated with loading bay and loading bay safety. In Europe, um, we don't do as many dock levelers because, as you know, there are massive players in the dock level market in Europe, like home and loading bay systems, etc. cetera. Um, we do a number of those, but we also do mainly concentrate on uh, wheel restraint safety. Um, the European market, uh, as um, Mark will know, is, is very different from the US market where you've, you've got many different types of vehicles that you've got to restrain. So there's many constraints about how you can keep a lorry at the dock with all the different designs. Um, and, and, and there are a number of different players with different designs throughout the Europe. But our main aim really is to improve safety at the loading bay. You know, there, there are a dock operator will cross a loading bay at least 100,000 times a year. Um, and you've got the edge of a building and a moving vehicle. Uh, and, and so you've got this constant issue of health and safety. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, Paul, um, online shopping, online logistics is becoming a massive part of our lives on a more daily basis. I mean, we've all had everything delivered over the last 12 months now because of COVID. And so certainly in the UK, uh, warehousing space is becoming a premium. Um, and retail shops are seen empty. So there's a lot of things happening in warehouse and logistics, which is in some ways good for us, but it also it causes a lot of issues with health and safety. So our main aim when we go and see a customer is to, to do reports with them, to look at how we can help improve the, the working environment, um, you know, from the, um, the energy saving through to the, the health and safety um, uh, uh, and lots of other different types of products. But it's an ever-changing market and ever-demanding customers requiring more and more from us. Um, budget is always an issue with customers. Historically, warehouses have always been um, the back end of a place and therefore not a huge amount of money spent on them because they're not manufacturing anything. They're not a showcase for customers. So there's always a pressure on them to move goods as quickly as they possibly can. So we've got to marry up productivity with health and safety. Um, and, you know, a lot of accidents occur, with, for instance, with forklift trucks in workplaces uh, around the world. Um, you know, in the UK, you're probably talking of probably one death every two or three weeks in the UK alone. Um, and, you know, it's much more in other countries. So it is, you know, a serious issue. Um, and what we want to try and do is get customers to think about this issue before anything bad happens. 
um, uh, you know, because often it's done retrospectively, which is no good for that poor person who's never gone home that day or been, you know, badly injured. Um, but more and more companies are buying into that aspect of health and safety, um, and they do need our help and assistance. I'm sure all of you here to to protect not just product but people. And uh, in, in doing so, you're improving productivity all the time when you do that. And, and, and I think that's what we got to try and get across with people, how uh, important it is to improve productivity, but do it safely and make more money and, and, and cause less issues and concerns for themselves. Um, certainly our health and safety executive in the UK and, and, and surely in different, I think it's OSHA in America, issue a lot of the uh, regulations in America. And of course, uh, EU, which until the first of January, UK were part of, we're, we're, we're still covered by a lot of the EU regulations in terms of health and safety. Um, I mean, France, for instance, in France, it's a legal requirement to have wheel restraints of some sort, but it's just a recommendation in other countries, just as it is in the US, just as it is in the UK. So people do take a bit more of a, again, <laughs> borrowing a French term, a laissez-faire approach to wheel restraints of any sort uh, in different countries apart from in France where it's compulsory. Um, so it's, you know, I, I feel it's my job to try and educate people and try and help them where I can to improve health and safety. That's really what I would say about Right Height. Uh, and certainly Mike White is of that because he was the original inventor of the original wheel restraint system yeah. and it's developed from there. And lots of other companies now have developed their own and there's lots of different types on the market and they've all got some very good points about them. And, um, and, and I think any type of wheel restraint is an improvement on not having any. <laughs> so that's what I would say to any customer. If they don't buy anything right height, then go out there and get something. So is, is the wheel restraint, Peter, sorry to interrupt you, is the wheel restraint your your sort of core product still? I suppose it's what right height are known for, um, certainly in the US. I mean, dock levelers are still a big part of the business, and, and um, mm. but really the wheel restraint, because it came out in 1980 as the dock lock, and it's had a lot of different uh, evolutions since then and changes and amendments and improvements. Um, in America, though, it's, it's a lot easier to do a wheel restraint because they have an impact bar at the back, as Mark and James will know, which is mandatory. It's a regular requirement. Um, and so it's, they can hook onto the back of the lorry. You come to Europe, <laughs> forget it. There are, there are trailers. There are all sorts, thousands of different types of trailers. So um, you can't have one type of locking system. Uh, to suit all, you know, sea containers have their own issues. Lorries with tail lifts. Um, you've got, you've now got uh, double deck lorries, mega trailers, which are becoming more prevalent. So there's lots of different types of designs and of course, different manufacturers. So what you find is that you can um, accommodate a large majority. So for instance, in Germany, they have these interchangeable containers, don't they? They stand on legs. I don't know if anybody's ever seen them. You know, yep. our, our wheel restraint system will work with that. You mm -hmm. know, and, um, and, and so you've got to come up with a different design for something which is totally, you know, foreign to people in the US and in lots of other countries in Europe. So yeah, I mean, it's what right I do, safety. I mean, it's evolved and grown bigger since then, mm -hmm. but which still really, that's what we're known as a, a, a you know, wheel restraint company. Right. Um, and, and we believe every company that manufactures wheel restraints are doing a good job because you're improving the health and safety of people, really. Um, Peter, when you go on a site survey and, you, and you, you visit a customer, how often are they surprised by what you can do for them? I think they're surprised about, um, one, a lot of them don't even know the regulation, for instance, in Europe, that you've got to have 75 mil of the dock level of plate in the back of the lorry. Uh, and, you know, you've got to have a certain amount of the edge, lip of the dock lever in the back of the lorry. Um, and with modern lorries, they've got bumpers on the back of lorries. You've got bumpers on the building. And often these lorries are too far away from the building and, and, and create gaps. So that's why you've got a wheel restraint. But they are surprised that, you know, just simple housekeeping things about the dock bumpers, because many of us will have gone to sites where the dock bumpers are literally falling off the walls. Um, and, and hanging off the floor and, and, and sitting there and they don't know they can, you know, rotate them, put different types on. Are they really the best sort of dock bumpers for their dock levelers? Are their docks at the right height? Have they got right, the right type of dock leveler in there? You know, sea containers call, 
sit much higher off the ground than your standard articulated lorry. You know, 1200 for a typical trailer. Sea containers at 14, 1500. So, I mean, you know, massive difference. Another foot difference in American terms, imperial, uh, in difference in height. So, there's a lot of things you can talk about with them. Um, and a lot of people obviously feel a bit uncomfortable about talking about any issues and problems they've had. And I have had people say, oh, we've not had an incident in 30 years. You know, when you're asking them to talk about, you know, investing in the back end of, of, of the building. But, you then talk to an operator. Oh yeah, we had we had a forklift truck and nearly went off the dock last week. <laughs> and so you you do find out that there's a lot more going on because it's, it's such a high intensity site. You know, right, yeah. sites are just you know you go there and and you know we've probably all been. I've seen Amazon as a good example on the con- and they're you know they're they're very health and safety conscious, but their sites are inten- intensely busy. Mm. You know, and then every single logistics company I go to at the moment, from the freezer chiller section through to uh, people like DHL and other, co- you know, their products are going through the door, going crazy. Um, and, and, and so in that, there, there's much more contact between moving goods and people, forklift trucks and people, lorries and people. So there's a lot of moving parts, which cause a lot of problems. I have, a question. I, Peter, I have a question to you then, eh? mm-hmm. and, and I'm not a, a super expert on, on, on the, the wheel locks, etc. Every time when I visit a, a, a site, a customer site, be it Cola, Procter & Gamble, whatever, what do you think about the safety uh, action of, of, of the area uh, near the dog leveler where the forklifts are racing in and out? That's typically an area where a lot of people are walking as well. Do you have any products for that or any solutions? Yeah, there? I, I mean, you know... Uh, the, you, you, you always try and segregate forklift trucks and people. Um, we do, like a lot of companies, um, uh, you know, impact barriers, s- steel ones, plastic ones, through to we do a lot of what we call curtain products, which to can create temporary walkways and, and cordon off and create walkways. Um, the heavy duty curtain one we use typically on the loading dock is the dock guardian, which will It'll stop a six and a half ton forklift truck at four and a half mile an hour. And, 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 but it is a bit like a, a seat belt. It tensions, gets tight and then stops. Uh, and obviously there are a lot of com- companies, uh, you know, Sentry Products is a good example where you're protecting areas, but you're not just protecting goods, you're protecting people because the whole idea is to try and keep these people separate because, um, uh, you know, most of the accidents and with forklift trucks involve people literally being hit by a forklift truck, which is going by, <laughs> or they're stepping out. Um, you know, we've got traffic light systems that we've introduced, which shine a blue light on the floor. You'll see a lot of forklift trucks. They've got blue lights and arrows now as standard. But, you know, I've been to sites where, you know, forklift trucks and powered pallet trucks, which, which are uh, driven by people, are going very, very fast. And, I mean, you're standing there as a person who's used to the environment thinking, I'm not really comfortable <laughs> being here and I'm just observing. So we've all seen that. And, you know, it's it's an education process. And, 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 and I think more and more people are becoming aware of the issues because, you know, if, if they get it wrong and someone gets badly injured, certainly in the UK, the, fine, the fines and penalties are going up in monetary value for them. You know, it's not uncommon for fines of 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, 4 million pounds you know, which is a lot of dollars and euros, whichever way you look at it. Um, and is then, it fair to say that most of your inquiries are driven by, you know, the need to meet regular, regular, sorry, current or future regulation rather well, than... Uh, the, the, the issue I think we find in, in Europe, as an example, is there's a lot of regulatory recommendations um, and, you know, what you should be doing and shouldn't be doing um, you know, yes, if you've got a machine, it's got to have a machine guard on. You've got to have an emergency stop button. That, when you get to production facilities, it's much more regimented. Mm-hmm. But a loading bay is a very fluid situation. It's a very fluid part of the building. So it's very difficult to say, well, this is going to happen that way. That's going to happen that way. You know, you can go to, uh, as very knows, you can go to somewhere like DHL and they've got huge conveyors going at the back of lorries. And huge conveyors all the way around the building and parcels moving at great speed. And then you've then got cages and you've got some powered pallets. And so there's lots of different things happening and, and it's very intense. So what you find is, um, 
Yes, that piece of machinery will have an emergency stop button, will have uh, anti-trap fingers, things on them. But when it comes to Lorden Bay, where you've got goods going in and out, and they've got to turn this lorry around within a certain period of time to get the next one on the bay, that's when um, you uh, the the recommended health and safety at work act, as we would say in the UK, is just that. It's, it's what mm. people should do, a, a duty of care. There has always been a duty of care in every country, but um, other than certain safety devices, like safety edges on doors and safety curtains, you know, when you look at the Lorden Bay, the only thing that's, you know, you've got, you've got a thing, you know, you've got a, uh, a safety edge on the edge of the, each of the dock levelers, you've got a safety edge on the door, but they're fairly standard bits of kit that you would expect on any door in any piece of machinery that was moving up and down. Um, the reality is that the, the risk of something happening with that is very low. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of someone falling off a four foot dock or a 1.2 metre dock, you're on hard concrete. Um, and, um, you know, I, I've had cases of people literally jumping onto the back of the lorry to put a parcel on because they forgot it and literally being thrown back out the back of the lorry. You know, is it possible uh, then? I'll, I'll move you. Thanks for your, uh, yeah. for your help here, Peter. We'll, we'll move on. But I mean, do you think it's possible to have a 100% safe loading bay? Um, I, 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 well, I don't <laughs> think it's possible be, as long as you've got that human element in it. Uh, you yeah, know, it, it would sure. be yeah, impossible. Exactly. You, you know, you, you can automate it as much as you can um, and, and reduce the interface. But the reality is, when you've got time constraints and time pressures and productivity levels to be met and customers to be satisfied, um, you, you've got to try and make a big effort to make it as safe as possible. Um, but most of the accidents occur when people are under pressure, they, they think they're doing the right thing, and, and they may be very experienced employees, not just some little mm. kid from school, little people with 10, 20, 30 years experience. And, um, you know, mo- most accidents, when you hear them, if, if the person wasn't hurt, you'd, you'd almost sort of laugh in a way because you'd say, well, yeah. why did you do that? Why would you jump on the back of a moving lorry? You'd never do that in any other environment. Why give us, Peter, that- mm-hmm. give, us, give us a single tip that, any, that, a, that a typical business could do to make its loading bay safer. Well, I, I think um, the, the segregation of the loading bay area from the area behind it where you've got thought the trucks moving so there's more of a control element there but ultimately uh, um, certainly from my experience in the UK it would be some form of um, wheel restraint system right most of the accidents happen when the lorry pulls away early or with trailer creep and trailer bounce which various mm-hmm. guys here have heard about you know when you've got heavy items going across especially with hydraulic suspension nowadays, these lorries bounce. <laughs> They're quite literally like a little Super Bowl bouncing away at a mill at a time until eventually the yeah. dock level can fall off. So it's really securing that lorry and letting the dock operator be in control of the process, take everything mm-hmm. you know away in, in, so that they're in control. Uh, of the process that's that's what i would say well thank you peter that's excellent it also brings us very neatly onto you mark if we can if we can move on to you you'll recognize a lot of that i presume yeah absolutely and thank you very much for um for allowing me to uh, present here i do have someone already sharing a screen uh, oh. which is not uh <laughs> no not, very, not according to my plan um uh, if i could just Oh, uh, well, okay. I guess I'm going to have to talk through it. Uh, but, uh, yes, yeah, so... Sorry, Mark, um, maybe, maybe if you talk, we'll be able to load your presentation to the website afterwards. But, um, okay, sorry that, about that. That, 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 that's fine. I appreciate it. And, and uh, I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what GMR does and uh, the, the solutions we have uh, and address some of Peter's points. And I agree wholeheartedly with what he said. Uh, I'd like to first apologize and say I'm, I'm speaking with an American accent, so I will be replacing words with trucks instead of lorries, etc. <laughs> process instead of process. Uh, so please bear with me, and uh, I, I'll be sure to have a translator in my next uh, in my next <laughs> presentation. Uh, but for 25 years, we've been providing a uh, unique wheel restraint system. Our uh, our factory and and construction processes are based on quality, premium material, expert workforce. 
uh, the, the popularity and word of mouth publicity uh, have allowed us to grow into uh, 28 countries across North America, Europe, and the Far East. The objective we have, similar to what Peter was talking about, is simple. It's saving lives. Uh, we've looked carefully at the dock loading sequences and the procedures of hundreds of sites and developed a solution to address the accidents related to vehicle movement during loading and unloading. So the product we created was is the power chalk, which is basically a chalk on steroids. It's a chalk with a, 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 a metal plate, which is embedded in the ground in front of the dock. So if you can imagine, it's so much easier with a video going, but if you can imagine uh, a chalk with teeth at the bottom of it that are placed in front of the wheel and they lock into uh, the metal plate, which is embedded in the ground also, with teeth in it uh, to, to provide that friction, uh, which holds the chalk in place, doesn't slide out. Um, it's robust, it's simple to use, the application is quick, and um, the installation options are universal. You can put it in basically any type of uh, environment. Uh, it's also indestructible, and we'll talk a bit about that in a second. Uh, the, the simple and eloquent solution means it's got very low maintenance. There's no lubrication needed or anything like that. And uh, like I said, it fits in several surfaces, also works in several climates. If we look at uh, uh, going on with what Peter was uh, talking about before, if we look at accident risks um, that occur during loading and unloading procedures, there are basically three major categories. The trailer creep, Peter was mentioning that before, the sliding away or the creeping of the vehicle during the unloading process. Unexpected departure, driver just gets into the cab and drives away due to miscommunication. While uh, there is either a forklift in the truck, about to go on the truck or just leaving the truck. And uh, open dock doors, you know, dock doors open and there's no truck at the door. Those are the main uh, uh, risks that you see. And if you look in the United Kingdom, there's over a quarter of a million accidents per year that are work-related, workplace-related, where the loading bays is the hot zone because of the movement, because of fluidity of motion uh, on those bays. And falls and crushing is the main, uh, the main two reasons or causes of work-related injuries. If we look at the concept, again, the video would have been great here, um, our, our chalk is simple physics. Basically, um, the way the chalk is, is, is built, it's based on our patented design, ensuring that the weight of the vehicle, as it uh, um, moves onto the chalk, it actually creates the pressure and makes the power chalk effective. Um, and if we look at, uh, well, if we can't look, but um, what we've done is we've developed the power chalk in a way that it links together with the lighting and alarm systems so that if it's removed during uh, the loading and unloading process, there is an alarm, a visible and audible alarm that goes off to instruct the driver to place the chalk back. It is connected with a door and with a loading mechanism, so the load master, if you like, uh, on the dock has really control of the situation and determines when it is safe to remove the chalk. Uh, uh, from the plate and therefore the driver uh, can drive away. So we have several chalks um, uh, to address different situations. As Peter was mentioning before in Europe, the, the, the vehicles um, uh, and the range of vehicles that are out there is, is extensive and we've developed the chalks to fit different sizes, different heights of the vehicles themselves. Uh, and basically any vehicle that has wheels that power chalk will work on. So it doesn't matter if the ICC bar in the back is broken. It doesn't matter if it has a lift gate. The chalk will always work with those uh, with those vehicles with wheels. And as a matter of fact, also on vehicles that don't have wheels. So last year, we developed a, a, a system called the Power Chalk 9, which secures both the swap bodies and the semi-trailers. So the example that Peter was talking about with the seat containers that are basically standing on stilts, yes, we have a solution for that, a power chalk nine that will ensure that it prevents the truck from going underneath the swap bodies while the door is open. And it also has sensors and alarms uh, for untimely vehicle departure. So it does work even when there is no wheel there, if you like to chalk. 
the uh, the product itself is so robust and uh, we're, we have so much trust in our quality and workmanship, we provide a five-year guarantee uh, for the power chalk, which is unheard of typically in the industry. This includes uh, unscheduled departure, which is known as abusive use. So if the driver decides to drive and try and get over the chalk, uh, the guarantee is covered there. The chalk doesn't do its work. It does stop the the driver, if the chalk is damaged in any way, we do uh, replace it at, at no cost whatsoever. When we look at the chalk itself, it, it is virtually maintenance free. Our, uh, we have several customers, I'll give an example. Cisco Foods here in the United States have several hundreds of our systems. They've averaged uh, six euros a year in maintenance per chalk, um, uh, as far as their maintenance costs are concerned. So you put that with together with the uh, investment, if you like, of the uh, uh, of the installation of our chalk, and you really get the total cost of ownership, which is the lowest on the market. Uh, we also provide the metal plates in the 3D format uh, that allows ground uh, that allows snow plows uh, to go over them and clean the snow out. So it does work in all climates um, as well. Uh, I talked about a bit about the compatibility uh, and the adaptability. I also wanted to mention that the chalk and the plate are easily uh, removed uh, to be reinstalled in another location. So we have several customers of ours that are third-party logistics companies. And uh, sometimes they uh, run warehouses that are not their own. Of, they run warehouses of their customer. As soon as the customer's contract is done, uh, the third-party logistics uh, company has the uh, the option and can and does remove the power trucks from uh, from that warehouse uh, very easily uh, very easily and reinstalls it at another warehouse to match a, no a new contract that they have with the customer. Uh, if we look at the the customers that we have, I mentioned Cisco, XPO, we have uh, DHL, Bridgestone, Kuhn and Nagel uh, across the the world basically. And uh, they've all attested, all our customers, that once they apply it as a test case uh, in their in their uh, network, they apply it to the entire network afterwards after going through that test. Um, that's basically it about the power chalk. Uh, again, I apologize for the American accent, uh, but I'll I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have, and hopefully I address a bit of that. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the issues that are in the loading and unloading at the base. If, if I, it's, I would say the, the video does more justice to it, but we've taken the human error out of that process of placing the chalk and removing the chalk. The driver is involved with the safety process, whether he likes it or she likes it or not. Um, so if they are involved with it in the placement of the chalk, the alarms that are uh, connected to the door opening and the loading sequence beginning. Uh, to ensure that that truck cannot move. Right. Thank you, Mark. Um, no it's great to get the perspective from the other side of the Atlantic because my, my perception would be that, and I could be wrong about this, is that America is, is less stringent in its regulations than Europe is. Uh, it'd be good to get your perspective on that. Um, they are, there, there is less of a, a governmental regulation required here, um, uh, in the United States and in Canada. I'll speak on behalf of Canada yeah. well, as a Canadian company. However, uh, the, the, uh, companies out here do place, uh, uh, importance on the dock safety and the dock safety operations. Now, you could say, yes, they do care about obviously the safety of the employees, the well-being of the employees to ensure that there's less accidents, etc. There's also, unlike uh, Europe, I would say that there's a fine that is imposed uh, uh, by the government if you're not following those sequences. Here, it's even trickier because you could be facing a civil suit as a big company if you haven't done your job right. And the consequences of that financially are way more significant. Yeah. So you do have the participation of the American companies in dock safety. We see a lot of dock locks from right height uh, mm -hmm. in this. And um, there is more and more cogniz uh, cog they're more and more cognizant of the safety requirements uh, here. Um, and uh, they do run into uh, what we call the, uh, the, the scenario where there is an accident. We've got to fix this. We've got to make sure this doesn't happen again. 
and they come to people like us or Right Height for a quick solution or for an immediate solution for them and then apply it to the rest of their network. Right. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, you know, I think it gives them a great insight yourself and Peter into the issues of, of the loading bay. They're not going to go away, but you're certainly doing wonderful things in trying to address them. I'd like to move on to James Ryan, if I may. Now, James is going to talk more generally about this really intriguing idea that the distribution center is somewhere where productivity and safety meet and mingle in that you can't have one without the other and that they're not mutually exclusive. So would you like to sort of just expand on that a bit, James, for us? Sure. And, and um, you know, I should I, say, by the way, sorry to interrupt, James is from Century Pro in the, uh, in the States. Yeah, sorry, James, carry on. That, that's quite all right. Yeah. I, and and a, a little bit of background about who we are. Yeah, great. Um, we are, uh, well, we've been in business for 22 years now. Uh, actually, 23 coming up this this year. We uh, started in 1998. Um, actually, because we were, uh, the company I was working for was in the building products uh, business. And uh, we had one of our contractors, uh, one of our customers bring us an idea that he had formed in the fact that he was a contractor who put up a lot of buildings um, and had customers come to him when they had uh, run a fork truck right into a building column. And he said, this is great business, but, uh, you know, because I have to replace the whole thing, it's, you know, I, I, I profit from it. But at the same time, they would usually call, you know, at the worst possible moment when he's, you know, you know, in a big uh, concrete pour, got a new business going on and the guy's got to have an emergency, uh, uh, um, you know, building column act to me. Um, but uh, so what he came up with, uh, because he happened to be working on a project where the manufacturing plant that he was he was doing was a plastics plant, um, that he and the uh, and the the owner of the plastics company came up with the idea of basically making a impact absorbing column protector. Um, they brought that idea to us. We ended up actually buying it, buying the rights to the, uh, to his patents and all, uh, and launched this. And we, we honestly launched it to, uh, contractors across the U S and it, it flopped because, you know, if you can imagine, uh, uh, with a bidding situation that a contractor has to come and say, okay, by the way, I want you to spend more money, you know, and they loses the bid. So they weren't really interested in doing it. But what we found was that, uh, going directly to the industry, the, the the reaction was was huge. So we spun off Sentry as a separate uh, business to do so. And uh, about eleven years ago, I purchased the company because I had been running it uh, since the beginning. But in essence, from there, we we spun off a number of products that were, um, you know, similar in in uh, in, in that vein. We were uh, working with a 3M in in Iowa about a project that they were doing for building columns. And he said, look, I, I've got, you know, six exposed building building columns, but we've buried the rest in all of these pallet racks. Do you have anything for that? And so we, at that point, invented the idea of an energy absorbing pallet rack protector, um, which I'm sure you see everywhere now. Uh, but we introduced the idea of actually having a, a rack attached energy absorbing thing. So then we've sold, uh, I, I, we're, we're approaching a million of those worldwide right now. So obviously it's an idea that struck home. Um, but, you know, in essence, that's what our company does. Uh, we have been active in the European markets since the year 2000. So it's about uh, 21 years. We have been producing um, at least part of our, our um, uh, product lines in Europe since about 2003, I believe, was when we started doing that. And uh, we have an extensive distribution network uh, through resellers throughout Western Europe and uh, the UK. So um, that's a little bit about our background. Um, where uh, And Paul, you'd asked uh, what I'd like to talk about. And, and I think that I, I'm kind of hitting on the same themes that, of course, Peter did and Mark did. And, mm, very much um, so. That you know, in essence, uh, a distribution center is, a, is a, the catchy title of saying where productivity and safety meet and mingle because there's just no one side or another that works. And if you can imagine saying, you know, well, could you make, 
could you make the Autobahn completely safe? Well, absolutely. Let's slow down every auto to, you know, say 20K per hour. You know, that would certainly be safe and you probably wouldn't kill anyone. But at the same time, the investment in, in, in that kind of infrastructure would, you know, w- wouldn't be very productive. So we look at the distribution centers the same way. And I hate to say, you know, U.S. sources here because I, but I'm sure that uh, FEM or ELA would, would have similar figures. But at least in the USA, um, typically in a year, about 850,000 forklifts are operation and 11% of those will have an accident every single year. Uh, so 96,000 plus, um, 95,000 injuries from fork truck ac- accidents and over 100 employees killed in fork truck accidents in the States. And again, I think you probably have same similar figures yeah. across Europe. Um, and these are no, I mean, this is, this is uh, earth shaking information because, of course, I, we all work with this every day. Um, of course, the, the top five places that they occur are at docks, conveyors. Uh, forklifts material handling, um, material storage, in other words, the pallet racks that are going to be collapsing. Um, and you look at it saying the safety is safety is savings, you know, when, and again, I, I, I cite some U.S. information because we just happen to have that uh, a little bit handier, but they said the ad- average work-related injury costs in, in U.S. dollars, 38,000 uh, U.S. dollars, and in direct costs and 150,000 in indirect costs. Uh, forklifts uh, accidents alone uh, account for in U.S. industry over $100 million in losses per year. So you, you, you see very quickly that, you know, that hits the bottom line. Not that, not that people's safety is simply a dollar figure, but it really impacts that bottom line. And the, but the other side of it is um, speed, equals productivity, equals profits for that distribution center because it's really important that you move quickly. Um, you know, you don't do that. You're, you're not utilizing your capital, you know, very, very wisely. You've got, you know, labor costs increase as productivity goes down. So you want to be able to do that. If you can imagine a, a, a distribution center running f- 10 fork trucks through there, if those 10 fork trucks can, can move a higher average of, of pallets movements per day, then you've got more utilization out of the same capital expenditure. So you've got two different things kind of fighting against each other here. Um, and, uh, and obviously a balance is needed. And, and what we, we look at it as saying, you know, if, if speed is reduced, safety increases, but profitability drops. If speed, you know, uh, is increased without safety, accident and uh, injury costs just add up too. So it they do get together and they are two things that are not really incompatible when you look at the overall cost. You've got to create a safe and efficient warehouse is, is, the, is the challenge here. And, um, you know, that, that uh, mandate really has to come from the top because, um, you know, I've been to, I've been to distribution centers across the years and, you can kind of tell when the management or the the people who are in charge either a don't pay attention to it or b they they give you know their safety is like yeah 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 we got to be safe too and if you don't look at it from the top saying you know you have to look at it immediately saying we need to be safe and efficient because we can pretend that safety is all we're you know it's all we care about and if you read the posters all over the place that's all they they think they do, but in reality, you've got to do that with productivity. And the reason why I say that's the most important thing is that if you if you look at it from the terms of being safe and efficient, you're probably going to work together with your people a lot better and saying, yes, yes, we know that we know that we need to be safe, but we've also got to you know we can't we can't stop our, our production. I, I was actually at a, at a distribution center uh, a couple of years ago uh, demonstrating one of our safety products and, and uh, they had wire guided vehicles that, you know, they, they would trip a line about, you know, about three or four meters from every intersection. And that would slow the, the vehicles down to like, you know, like one kilometer per hour. I mean, and that's great. 
But, you know, you're sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting for that thing to turn the corner. That's a terrific safe spot. But at the same time, it's, you know, it, are you losing? Is it, is it, have you gone overboard one way? And then I've seen the other, you know, I don't, I'm sure all of us have been in places where you don't see any safety at all. And you really, you don't even want to step foot out there because you're going to get run over by something. So, you know, there has to be both ways. And it has to be a continual process the way you're always adapting and changing um, and changing in the marketplace because of people like, you know, Peter's company, Mark's company, where there's always some new items that are out there. And in essence, uh, uh, where we stress our business is, is in creating that third way, which is uh, creating a, a more resilient warehouse. And, you know, with that resilient is obviously there's a, a number of factors that can come in there. There's proper separation of forklifts from people. Um, you know, that can be, you know, barrier systems. I know there's a number of companies that have flexible barrier systems beyond mm -hmm. steel ones. Uh, a safe boat plan. Uh, there's a number of them that will be flexible at the same time, separating people from there where you can. Um you know, we'll put a plug for ourselves, column and rack protection, where you can you can bump into things without ruining things. Um, if you can increase uh, slightly the speed that you can bump into a pallet rack without having the whole thing collapse, well, then it's not only safe, but it's more efficient. And, uh, you know, it, it just even an enhanced uh, hazard awareness through signage, through... Um, you know, we see, uh, you know, the it, uh, systems that are, you know, mirrors that go around. There's a number of things. There's barrier systems. There's forklift attachments that uh, are mirrors and anti-slip pieces that are on fork tines. All of those things are making a more resilient warehouse that actually makes you be able to balance the, you know, safety versus productivity and push it a little bit more into the productivity because it's really the bottom line. I mean, there's gate system, you know. Uh, the dock locks from from right height we've seen for years. Absolutely, you should be integrating that into a, a resilient warehouse. Um, floor marking systems. Um, our biggest growth product in the last uh, number of years has simply been our uh, blind corner warning systems, where we brought this out uh, about eight years ago, and we're on our fifth version now, and it's just a uh, a portable uh, battery run piece that gets snapped onto the uh, corner of a of a pallet rack at a blind corner, and it uh, looks at its motion detectors looking at both sides. And when there's uh, the possibility of a of a collision, meaning there's motion on both sides of that corner, it flashes a warning. It's a a visual and audio warning, and that has grown tremendously as people looked at it and said, "Well." You know, maybe I don't have to stop a fork truck at the end of this aisle and creep through the corner, which is really not realistic. You're not going to do that in a, you know, and then at the same time, tell your forklift driver, you got to keep moving and then expect them to do yeah. that. So what are you doing? What are you introducing that will allow them to do a little bit of both of the of sides of that equation? Yeah, it's the, the example of the product you just gave it was it was a great example of a product which you can introduce because you can prove it can optimize your processes, um, yes. as opposed to I'm doing it because I have to because otherwise someone will get hurt, which is a really you know it's it's not a good business if you know what I mean. It's not normally right. the reason that owners like. So I'm just wondering what the biggest challenge you face when you go and meet a new customer, a new prospect. What's the challenge you face from those who say, I don't want to make this, you know, this is not a, this is okay. I want to do th this investment, but it's a nice to have, not a need to have. I suspect. Well, it's it's, it's interest, interesting. You bring that up, Paul, because, you know, as you can imagine back in 1998, when we introduced the idea of a column protector, you know, the first reaction was simply that, you know, and, and, and we could all laugh because we've, we've been in that same situation. We just said, you know what? We're going to talk to our fork truck drivers about not running into those columns. And I would say, that's terrific. Here's my number. Give me a call. And, and invariably, they would call with a, how fast can you get me the products out here? Because we've had an accident and we have to show either, you know, in, yeah. in the U.S. case, OSHA, or I have to show the, you know, the, the big wigs at our company that we're doing something about this. And I remembered that you told me about this ahead of time. So, yeah, it's, it's the idea that this is going to work without 
making that resilient warehouse and 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 uh you know we can get away with that because it again it's upfront cost it's 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 an insurance it's an insurance policy you pay up front so that i don't have to pay later but that upfront sometimes hurts and uh, can, I, can i ask a question james it's, sure. it's, it's, for me it's wildly interesting uh, 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 and i'm not directly in this uh, pure safe safety mm-hmm. uh, type systems but for me it's unbelievable that that they, many of these things are not a, a, a law yet or or, or um, prescribed it, it, driving a car without a seatbelt is dangerous right so so uh, how come um, in, 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 in Holland we, we, uh, we check our warehouses for uh, green energy and you get specific uh, uh, whatever points and, and um, um, certificates that a, a warehouse is super green, etc. Et Why don't big companies standardize on doing an audit and you have to at least score whatever 90 out of 100 and, and, and if not you have to invest XYZ to, to upgrade. Uh, wheel locks, uh, uh, barriers, segregation for, for, for people for focus. It's amazing it, 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 that that doesn't happen as standard. It, it is, but I think what you find is the ones who are very successful in the long term, they do implement these things. Uh, the ones that are probably a little bit more short sighted think that, well, you know, my bottom line, I don't want to put this out up front. So if they're in business long enough, They, they get around to it because they eventually learn that lesson. But it's amazing yeah. to me that it's a choice. It's a, it, yeah. that, it is, that it is a choice. Everybody's seen these videos that uh, uh, I think there was uh, Far East uh, uh, somewhere that somebody slams into uh, with a forklift slams into the, 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 the column and, and the whole warehouse goes. Yeah, and, and whether or not it's fake or not, uh, sure. But these things happen. Yes, that it's that it is still a choice in this day and age. Amazing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and it is interesting. Uh, uh, it, it still is a choice to put on a seatbelt as well. You just face the consequences if you don't put them on. It's your choice to go in and put on the seatbelt or not. Yeah, ironically, in my state, it's not. <laughs> I think just as well, James, and I'm sure you and everybody else have seen this. Even with global companies, uh, James, I find that. You, in the UK, they go, well, yeah, we do that in America, but we're not America. And then you, you, you speak to someone in Germany and I go, oh, we're doing this in the UK. And they go, oh, they won't do that here because each mm-hmm. little division of these big companies likes to be their old fiefdom, don't they? They like to think they're doing it right. Uh, and, and this is some of the, the politics or, 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 or the constraints, whether it's budgetary or not, you've got to try and overcome. And, and, and I find that an interesting aspect where you think, you're going to get a warm welcome <laughs> from someone who you've got a good relationship elsewhere, but you don't, do you? Oh, the first time you, you walk in, you say, well, I've just spoken with someone else at your company in a different location, and you think it's a slam dunk, and then you walk in there, and they're like, well, we're different here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's people. It's human nature. Yeah. I mean, it's what we run into with everything we do. Uh, you know, there's a balance, and, and in, in uh, the States, there is uh, obviously – uh, a very big reluctance to have the government come in and tell you what to do. But the other side of that, and as Mark alluded to, you know, we have the court systems here and, and it's a, uh, you know, it, it can be a free for all. And you could say, I can, I can operate without these things, but then eventually you get that one lawsuit that costs you millions or, you know, yeah. and, and all of a sudden people start paying attention to that. So it doesn't have to be a, a, a regulation but it's good practices. And I think the, the longer and the smarter that these people are in, in the distribution centers, they eventually get to it. But as you said, Peter, there are so many instances where you just, um, you know, you, you just, uh, you run up against a brick wall. You well, uh, can't uh, get it I, through I, their heads. It, it, you're right. It does amaze me. And I, and I think your product is, is, is very good because, but I, I was in a warehouse quite literally last week, which is, multi-million pound brand new warehouse with I've never seen so much racking in all my life and they don't have any impact posts or anything protecting any of it um and 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 I and I say oh well you know we'd recommend you put impact posts on the loading dock around the sectional door to protect Mm -hmm. them because any part of the door it's the frame that gets damaged and suddenly your whole door's out of operation so just put a key clamp post sitting in front of it it's a very simple thing, or one of your impact posts. And then I looked around and 
wow, you've got millions of square feet of racking here and, 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 and nothing to stop faultless trucks. And, and Peter, Peter, where lies the fault in that then? It, it's not consulted well, the, in the right the, way? It's not, it, 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 it was a budgetary? Where well, it, uh, again, I, I think um, it, certainly in the UK, we get a lot of buildings made under what we call design and build, where contractors are bidding, and whoever comes in the cheapest to a certain specification gets it. And, and, and this is the problem. Uh, you know, these buildings are made, and they are expensive, but they're made as cheaply as possible um and 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 of course extras which aren't standard on racking or aren't standard on dock loading base like wheel restraints of any sort mark will know this you go to a brand new 100 dock level uh, distribution center you'll never see a wheel restraint on it on any of them <laughs> uh and, and and you've then got a big task because you're asking the customer to say well you know you've got 100 loading bays here i want you know, 100 wheel restraints and, you know, oh, well, hang on, how much is that going to be? Well, it's going to be, you know, half a million dollars or a quarter of a million dollars or two million dollars, whatever it may Peter, be. So I'm going to have to interrupt yeah. you, sorry, because I'm looking at the clock. Yeah. And I want to speak to Valter about the Jaloda Hydro Roll. And yeah, no problem. Kind of area. So just thanks to James for it. That was really fascinating. I'd love to get into a bit more detail on that another time with you, but um, thank mm -hmm. you for that. Uh, so, Wouter, tell us a bit about the loading bay automation sector. Yeah, guys. Yeah, so, so I'm Wouter, uh, I'm based in the Netherlands, uh, the sales director and the owner of uh, Geloda. We are in business uh, uh, 59 years, and we are uh, in loading and unloading solutions, and uh, we are actually a UK-based company. We sell in 29 countries with uh, with distributors. And it's all about automation. So I would like to tap into something that James said really nicely. He said about the Autobahn. I love the Autobahn because it's right around the corner and I have a mm -hmm. relatively fast electric car. But um, um, <laughs> for safety and we slow down everything to, to 20 miles uh, per hour, right? that will be safe. What I see a lot is that that um, uh, people make even bigger steps and it's all automated. So it's we, uh, we need to segregate people and forklifts. Well, you know what? We just demand the forklift. And I see um, uh, with with automatic loading, we're not in AGVs, but an, an AGV cannot load uh, uh, any size uh, of mm -hmm. trailer or van, etc. So that's where we come in because we are coming from this truck uh, truck market. Um, I, I will share, uh, Paul, a really nice video of Coca-Cola in South America where you think, well, that's lower lower uh, cost. And, and these guys have automated everything from the bottling lines, from the handling with AGVs to the loading docks, automatic loading to a warehouse around, uh, uh, this is in Chile, Santiago City, automatic unloading and only there a forklift comes. So I'm not saying we take away the man driven forklift at all, but to go back to that uh, autobahn, let's not slow it down, let's make it self driven. And uh, we see other projects now where we have um, uh, the, the end of the production line 100% automated. An AGV places a pallet on a Geloda loading uh, um, uh, system. We automatically load the trailer uh, with adaptation or without adaptation of the trailer because that's clearly a clearly thing. Many times we um, we integrate our PLC of the loading system is actually integrated with a wheel lock or chalk. I haven't seen w w for automation there yet, but uh, anything that that holds that trailer and locks the trailer, 100% automated. So nobody touches it there and nobody actually walks into the operation just like that. And um, for high volume uh, operations, Procter & Gamble, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, automotive, incoming goods, that's that's really uh, interesting, just demand it. The next step, and there's now a project in uh, Singapore and also a project in Holland where there's, it's a self-driven truck even. So that's, that's where you come with the Autobahn, everybody just logs in, you just go. And I think, uh, really think that these steps, we will, it will never be 100% demand. It will never be 100% AGV, uh, robot, forklift, whatever. But I think we'll see less and less and less people in those operations, lights out. And, and, um, and one of the reasons is definitely safety and the cost uh, uh, um, of, of human error and, and, and things like that. And that, that's, that's what Geloda is in. Um, um, we load a trailer within two minutes. We unload the trailer within two minutes. It's 100% fail safe. We lock the trailer. We level the trailer because we push in 25 tons, 30 tons. The trailer wants to move away, wants to move down. We we uh, we control that, and um, it 
for the for the biggest volume between a factory and a central warehouse where you see a lot of forklift uh, traffic normally, yeah, loading and unloading, racing in, racing out, we just automate it. And if you see the immense relaxation that brings to the whole process, um, it's it's uh, it's amazing. And I literally tell my clients, once you have used this, you're hooked. You you, you don't want to go without it. You can't go without it. And, and you will be looking at, at uh, other uh, um, solutions for other outbound flows that you also want to automate. Um, but I think it's the segregation. And I'm amazed about these three professionals who've been in this business for, for many, many years, that it's still a choice of, 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 um, of introducing safety within uh, a warehouse or within a loading. But I think we should somehow in Europe, eh, we, we love uh, certification, Germany, Deca, TÜV, and, 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 and the certification mafia. Let's get a certification of a safe warehouse. What is that? Let's define that as a, as a, as a group. And you have to score 90 points and higher. And it can be with loading automation. It can be with, 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 with hooks, chocks, uh, uh, pillar covers, uh, dead angle uh, uh, detection. Uh, the time is now to act by anybody that owns a warehouse, but also a professional group like this. So guys, an oper- a warehouse that it does not have the... 90% uh, plus uh, uh, stamp on it that it's safe enough. Shouldn't be operating at all. It's crazy. Um, Very safe points. Good points. I, I see a, a question here. Is the beverage sector particularly important for Geloda? If so, why? That's, um, that's a, a, a question of David Prisma. It pops up in my screen. Does everybody see that or no, not? No, I don't see it. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but yeah, David will have had that come through from attendee. Yeah. Ah, okay, interesting. Okay, yeah. I can answer that. I think uh, one one thing, beverage industry, and maybe my, my colleagues on this call as well. We segregate. Uh, Geloda segregates with um, in in industries and specifically uh, beverage. It's a high volume incoming industry. Empty cans, empty bottles coming in, and and uh, uh, full product, heavy product going out. It's ideal for, for automation. So you see the big guys around the world, Anheuser Busch, uh, AB InBev, the uh, largest beer brewer in the world, um, 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 Coca Cola, everybody. These guys are uh, high volume shippers. So their loading automation and, and safety are uh, very, very important uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're almost at the end of our time, but you've, you've all talked so well. But I, I do want to ask the question, because it's, it's, it's so important with safety being talked about in this last hour. How much has the, of the requirements of social distancing affected your, um, the operation of your products? Uh, and how have, you, have you had to modify anything in, in terms of the, the changes that we've all had to live, learn to live with? Anyone want to take that? Well, I can say as far as, um, you know, I'd have to address that on our, our manufacturing end. And yeah. that has very much affected what we've done. And, and it's, it's being echoed all the way back through. And, you know, in the States, we've had horrible outbreaks, uh, as, as the world has. I mean, I don't think anybody's, um, I, so to say immune from this, but, uh, it, it's, uh, what we found is that, operations that uh, in molding which is you know we're heavily into that um and our suppliers are when you have to separate people you've automatically slowed down the process because when you whenever mm-hmm. you had any cooperative things you know that's one thing so the, the processes had to be separated so the people could be apart but on top of that with a uh, number of the protocols of saying if someone had tested or someone's relative had tested we're missing people simply because they can't be there. They need to, they need to, um, you know, isolate for two weeks or so. That's interrupted. And we've been through a period where we've never had the, uh, lead times that, that we've, we've gone through, not only on our end, but from even our supplies of, of raw materials coming through. We go through a lot of straps. Well, you know, the, the folks at Velcro in Canada where we're purchasing those. They were weeks and weeks and weeks behind. So we were ready on the molding end and waiting for parts. So everywhere along the supply chain, I think it's affected, even if you've got, what do they say? The, a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and yeah. there's a lot of links along there. So I think everybody's going to be running into this uh, similar similar maybe, situation. Maybe also, Paul, we've seen a big influx in requests 
from countries where we normally would not have because people still handball in boxes, mm-hmm. in containers, etc., etc. Can two, three people in a container? Sorry, gets too close. No way. So, yeah. so yeah. Uh, uh, loading automation is uh, is is definitely, let's say, a, a Corona winner. We're all losers uh, uh, of this pandemic. But but uh, there's a lot of a uh, focus of of uh, of taking people out of the process, especially inside mm-hmm. confined spaces, loading spaces. We see a big, a big request uh, increase in that. Yeah, I think this has just been an, an accelerator of what was already yeah. happening, and the and the things that were the pressures that were there in automation are going to get uh, higher and higher when you see that again. You know, your your process isn't resilient enough. Um, a virus could take it out, but you know, a number of other po- uh, things could cool. too. And safety is one of them. If someone's injured, you're missing someone. So, um, absolutely. Thank you, James. And thank you, everyone. We've reached the end of our allocated hour. Um, As I said earlier, there will be videos and presentations you'll be able to catch on the Logistics Business website. And Mark, in particular, had one. You'll be able to see that on our website in due course. Um, Thanks, guys, for your amazing uh, insights there. Mark Kennedy from GR, Valter Satine from Jaloda Hyder Roll, Peter Poulin from Right Height, and James Ryan from Century Pro. Thanks, guys. I look forward to meeting you in person again soon. When Corona's over. Hopefully very soon. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.